She missed it by a fraction. She nearly cut it, but not quite. She went in just right, Case thought, the right attitude. It was something he could sense, something he could have seen in the posture of another cowboy leaning into a deck, fingers flying across the board. She had it, the thing, the moves, and she pulled it all together for her entrance, pulled it together around the pain in her leg and marched down Three Jane's stairs like she owned the place, elbow of her gun arm at her hip, forearm up, wrist relaxed, swaying the muzzle of the Fletcher with the studied nonchalance of a Regency duelist. It was a performance. It was like the culmination of a lifetime's observation of martial arts tapes, cheap ones, the kind Case had grown up on. For a few seconds he knew she was every badass hero, the whole lineage back to Lee and Eastwood. She was walking it the way she talked it. Lady Three Jane Marie France Tessier Ashpool had carved herself a low country, flush with the inner surface of Straylight's hull, chopping away the maze of walls that was her legacy. She lived in a single room so broad and deep that its far reaches were lost to the inverse horizon, the floor hidden by the curvature of the spindle. The ceiling was low and irregular, done in the same imitation stone that walled the corridor. Here and there across the floor were jagged sections of wall, waist-high reminders of the labyrinth. There was a rectangular turquoise pool centered ten meters from the foot of the stairway, its underwater floods the apartment's only source of light, or it seemed that way to Case as Molly took her final step, the pool threw shifting blobs of light across the ceiling above it. They were waiting by the pool. He'd known that her reflexes were souped up, jazzed by the neurosurgeons for combat, but he hadn't experienced them on the SimStim link. The effect was like tape run at half speed, a slow, deliberate dance choreographed to the killer instinct and years of training. She seemed to take the three of them in at a glance. The boy poised on the pool's high board, the girl grinning over her wine glass, and the corpse of Ashpool, his left socket gaping black and corrupt above his welcoming smile. He wore his maroon robe. His teeth were very white. The boy dove, slender brown, his form perfect. The grenade left her hand before his hands could cut the water. Her Fletcher whined as she sent a storm of explosive darts into Ashpool's face and chest. And he was gone, smoke curling from the pocked back of the empty, white enameled pool chair. The muzzle swung for three Jane as the grenade detonated, a symmetrical wedding cake of water rising, breaking, falling back. But the mistake had been made. Hideo didn't even touch her then. Her leg collapsed. In Garvey, Case screamed. It took you long enough, Riviera said his fingers plucking things from her jacket. Her hands vanished to the wrists in a matte black sphere. Case felt her move her fingers experimentally. The material of the ball seemed to offer no more resistance than temper foam. The pain in her leg was excruciating, impossible. A red moray shifted in her vision. I wouldn't move them if I were you. The interior of the ball seemed to tighten slightly. It's a sex toy Jane bought in Berlin. Wiggle them long enough and it crushes them to a pulp. She groaned. You seem to have injured your leg, he said. His fingers found the flat packet of drugs in the left back pocket of her jeans. Well, he said, my last taste, and just in time. The shifting mesh of blood began to whirl. Hideo, said another voice, a woman. She's losing consciousness. Give her something, for that and for the pain. She's very striking, don't you think, Peter? These glasses, are they a fashion where she comes from? Cool hands unhurried with a surgeon's certainty, the sting of a needle. I wouldn't know, Riviera was saying. I've never seen her native habitat. They came and took me from Turkey. The sprawl, yes, said the voice. We have interests there. And once we sent Hideo, my fault, really, I'd let someone in, a burglar. He took the family terminal. She laughed. 
I made it easy for him to annoy the others. He was a pretty boy, my burglar. Is she waking, Hideo? Shouldn't she have more? More and she would die, said a third voice. The blood mesh slid into black. The music returned, horns and piano, dance music, and flaring in her eyes. Case, case, jack out. After images of the flashed words danced across Malcolm's eyes and creased forehead as Case removed the troads. You scream, man, while I go. Molly, he said, his throat dry, got hurt. He took a white plastic squeeze bottle from the edge of the G-Web and sucked out a mouthful of flat water. I don't like how any of this shit is going, he said, the little cray monitor lit, the fin against a background of twisted, impacted junk. Hey, neither do I, Case. We got a problem. Malcolm pulled himself up over Case's head, twisted and peered over his shoulder. Now, who is that mon, Case? That's just a picture, Malcolm, Case said wearily. Guy I know in the sprawl. It's Wintermute talking. Picture's supposed to make us feel at home. Bullshit, the Finn said. Like I told Molly, these aren't masks. I need them to talk to you. Because I don't have what you'd think of as a personality much. But all that's just pissing in the wind, Case, because like I just said, we got a problem. Molly's legs falling off for starts, can't walk, so I want you two to go in after her. Case stared at the face on the screen. Us? So who else? Errol, Case said, the guy on Babylon Rocker, Malcolm's pal. No, gotta be you. Gotta be somebody who understands Molly, who understands Riviera. Malcolm here for muscle. You may forget that I'm in the middle of a little run here, Case said. Remember what you hauled my ass out here for? Hey, Case, the Finn said. Listen up. Time's tight. Very tight. Listen. The real link between your deck and Straylight is a code broadcast over Garvey's navigation system. You'll take Garvey into a very private dock, I'll show you. The Chinese virus has completely penetrated the fabric of the Hosaka. There's nothing in the Hosaka but virus now. When you dock, the virus will be interfaced with the Straylight custodial systems and will cut the code. You'll take your deck, the Flatline, and Malcolm. You'll find 3Jane, get the word out of her, kill Riviera, get the key from Molly. You can keep track of the program by jacking your deck into the Straylight system. I'll handle it for you. There's a standard jack in the back of the head, behind a panel with five zircons. Kill Riviera, Case asked. Kill him, the Finn said. Case blinked at the representation of the Finn. He felt Malcolm put his hand on his shoulder. Hey, Case said, you forgot something. He felt the rage rising in a kind of glee. You fucked up. You blew the controls on the grapples when you blew Armitage. Hanaiwa's got us good and tight. Armitage fried the other Hosaka and the mainframes went with the bridge, right? The Finn nodded. So we're stuck out here, and that means you're fucked, man. He wanted to laugh, but it caught in his throat. Case Mon, Malcolm said softly. Remember, Garvey a tug. That's right, said the Finn, and smiled. You having fun in the big world outside, the construct asked when Case jacked back in. Figured that was Wintermute requesting the pleasure. Yeah, Case said, you bet. Quang okay? Bang on, man, that's a killer virus. Okay, got some snags, but we're working on it. You want to tell me, maybe, Dixie said. I don't have time, Case said. Well, boy, never mind me. I'm just dead anyway. Fuck off, Case said and flipped cutting off the torn fingernail edge of the flatline's laughter. She dreamed of a state involving very little in the way of individual consciousness, 3Jane was saying. She cupped a large cameo in her hand, extending it toward Molly. The carved profile was very much like her own. Animal bliss. I think she viewed the evolution of the forebrain as a sort of sidestep. Only in certain heightened modes would an individual, a clan member, suffer the more painful aspects of self-awareness. Molly nodded. Case remembered the injection. What had they given her? The pain was still there, but it came through as a tight focus of scrambled impressions. Her hands, still locked in the black ball, were on her lap. She sat in one of the pool chairs, her broken leg propped straight in front of her on a camel-skin hassock. 
three Janes sat opposite, on another hassock, huddled in an oversized jalaba of unbleached wool. She was very young. Where'd Riviera go, Molly asked, to take his shot? Three Janes shrugged beneath the folds of the pale, heavy robe and tossed a strand of dark hair away from her eyes. He told me when to let you in, Three Jane said. He wouldn't tell me why. Everything has to be a mystery. Would you have hurt us? Case felt Molly hesitate. I would have killed him, she said. I'd have tried to kill the ninja. Then I was supposed to talk with you. Why? Three Jane asked, tucking the cameo back into one of the jalabas in her pockets. And why? And what about? Because I hate him, Molly said at last. But Hideo, Three Jane asked, because they're the best. Because one of them killed a partner of mine once. Because I had to see, Molly said. And then we would have talked, you and I, like this. Her dark hair was very straight, center parted, drawn back into a knot of dull sterling. Shall we talk now? Take this off, Molly said, raising her captive hands. You killed my father, Three Jane said, no change whatever in her tone. He killed the puppet, Molly said. It looked like you. He was fond of broad gestures, Three Jane said, and then Riviera was beside her, radiant with drugs. Getting acquainted? She's an interesting girl, isn't she? I thought so when I first saw her. He stepped past Three Jane. It isn't going to work, you know, he said to Molly. Isn't it, Peter? Molly managed to grin. Winter Mute won't be the first to have made the same mistake. Underestimating me, Riviera crossed the tiled pool border to a white enamel table and splashed mineral water into a heavy crystal highball glass. He talked to me, Molly. I suppose he talked to all of us. You and Case, whatever there is of Armitage to talk to. He can't really understand us, you know. He has his profiles, but those are only statistics. You may be the statistical animal, darling, and case is nothing but. But I possess a quality unquantifiable by its very nature. He drank. And what exactly is that, Peter? Molly asked, her voice flat. Riviera beamed. Perversity, he said. He walked back to the two women, swirling the water that remained in the dense, deeply carved cylinder of rock crystal, as though he enjoyed the weight of the thing. An enjoyment of the gratuitous act. And I have made a decision, Molly, a wholly gratuitous decision. She waited, looking up at him. Oh, Peter, Three Jane said, with the sort of gentle exasperation ordinarily reserved for children. No word for you, Molly. He told me about that, you see. Three Jane knows the code, of course, but you won't have it. Neither will Wintermute. My Jane's an ambitious girl in her perverse way. He smiled again. She has designs on the family empire and a pair of insane artificial intelligences, kinky as the concept may be, would only get in our way. He drank off the last of the mineral water, and then his face pink with the pleasure of cocaine and meperidine, he swung the glass hard into her left lens implant, smashing vision into blood and light. Malcolm was prone against the cabin ceiling when Case removed the trodes. He had his shirt off and was working on a central panel with a clumsy-looking zero-G wrench, the thing's fat counter-springs twanging as he removed another hex head. Marcus Garvey was groaning and ticking with G-stress. The mute take an ionide dock, the Zionite said, popping the hex head into a mesh pouch at his waist. Mail come pilot the landing. Meantime, need we tool for the job. You keep tools back there? Case craned his neck and watched cords of muscle bunching in the brown back. This one, Malcolm said, unwrapping an ancient oil slick Remington automatic shotgun, its barrel chopped off a few millimeters in front of the battered forestock. The shoulder stock had been removed entirely, replaced with a wooden pistol grip wound with dull black tape. He smelled of sweat and ganja. That the only one you got? Case asked. 
Sure, man, Malcolm said, wiping oil from the black barrel with a red cloth, the black poly wrapping bunched around the pistol grip in his other hand. I and I, the Rastafarian Navy. You believe it. Case jacked in. Hey, the construct said. Old Peter's totally apeshit, huh? They seemed to be part of the Tessier Ashpool ice now. The emerald arches had widened, grown together, become a solid mass. Green predominated in the plains of the Chinese program that surrounded them. We getting close, Dixie? Real close, Case. Need you soon. Listen, Dix, Wintermute says Quang set itself up solid in our Hosaka. I'm going to have to jack you and my deck out of the circuit, haul you into Straylight, and plug you back in. Into the custodial program there, Wintermute says. Says the Quang virus will be all through them. Then we run from inside, through the Straylight net. Wonderful, the flatline said. I never did like to do anything simple when I could do it ass backwards. Case flipped. Into her darkness, a churning synesthesia, where her pain was the taste of old iron, scent of melon, wings of a moth brushing her cheek. She was unconscious, and he was barred from her dreams. When the optic chip flared, the alphanumerics were haloed, each one ringed with a faint pink aura. 072940. I'm very unhappy with this, Peter. Three Jane's voice seemed to arrive from a hollow distance. The SimStim unit was intact and still in place. He could feel it digging against her ribs. Her ears registered the vibration of the girl's voice. Riviera said something brief and indistinct. But I don't, Three Jane said, and it isn't fun. Hideo will bring a medical unit down from intensive care, but this needs a surgeon. There was a silence. Very distinctly, Case heard the water lap against the side of the pool. What was that you were telling her when I came back? Riviera was very close now. About my mother. She asked me to. I think she was in shock, aside from Hideo's injection. Why did you do that to her? I wanted to see if they would break, Riviera said. One did, Three Jane said. When she comes around, if she comes around, we'll see what color her eyes are. She's extremely dangerous, too dangerous. If I hadn't been here to distract her, where would you be in her power? No, Three Jane said, there was Hideo. I don't think you quite understand about Hideo. She does, evidently. Like a drink, Riviera said. Wine, Three Jane said, the white. Case jacked out. Malcolm was hunched over Garvey's controls, tapping out commands for a docking sequence. The module's central screen displayed a fixed red square that represented the Straylight dock. Garvey was a larger square green that shrank slowly, wavering from side to side with Malcolm's commands. To the left, a smaller screen displayed a skeletal graphic of Garvey and Hanaiwa as they approached the curvature of the spindle. You missed the mute, man, Malcolm said. Mute say he messin' the security for Garvey. Garvey dockin' is another boat. Boat they spectin' out of Babylon. Mute broadcastin' codes for us. We gonna wear the suits, Case asked. Too heavy, Malcolm shrugged. Stay in web till I tell you. He tapped a final sequence into the module and grabbed the worn pink handholds on either side of the navigation board. On the smaller screen, Hanaiwa lowered her bow to miss the curve of the spindle and was snared. Garvey was still slung beneath her like a captive grub. They were attached to the spindle now, rotating with it. Malcolm spread his arms, flexed tension from his shoulders, and removed his purple dread bag, shaking out his locks. Come now, man, if you said time be most precious. The Villa Straylight was a parasitic structure, Case reminded himself, as he stepped past the tendrils of caulk and through Marcus Garvey's forward hatch. Straylight bled air and water out of Freeside, and had no ecosystem of its own. 
Malcolm was already making his way up the rings of the gangway, pulling himself up with his left hand, the Remington in his right. He wore a stained pair of baggy fatigues, his sleeveless green nylon jacket, and a pair of ragged canvas sneakers with bright red soles. The gangway shifted slightly each time he climbed to another ring. Mon, Malcolm said quietly, you get up here, side me. Case edged sideways on the circular ladder and climbed the last few rungs. The gangway ended in a smooth, slightly convex hatch, two meters in diameter. The hatch was centered in a round, vaulted chamber floored with blue, non-slip plastic tiles. Malcolm nudged him, pointed, and he saw a monitor set into a curved wall. On the screen, a tall young man with the tessier ash pool features was brushing something from the sleeves of his dark suit coat. He stood beside an identical hatch in an identical chamber. Very sorry, sir, said a voice from a grid centered above the hatch. Case glanced up. Expected you later at the axial dock. One moment, please. On the monitor, the young man tossed his head impatiently. Malcolm spun as a door slid open to their left, the shotgun ready. A small Eurasian in orange coverall stepped through and goggled at them. He opened his mouth but nothing came out. He closed his mouth. Case glanced at the monitor. It was blank. Who, the man managed. The Rastafarian Navy, Case said, standing up, the cyberspace deck banging against his hip, and all we want's a jack into your custodial system. The man swallowed. Is this a test? It's a loyalty check. It must be a loyalty check. He wiped the palms of his hands on the thighs of his orange suit. No, man, this be real one. Malcolm came up out of his crouch with the Remington pointed at the Eurasian's face. You move it, man. They came to another monitor, an antique Sony, this one mounted above a console with a keyboard and a complex array of jack panels. The screen lit as they halted, the fin grinning tensely out at them from what seemed to be the front room of Metro Holographics. Okay, he said. Malcolm takes this guy down the corridor to the open locker door, sticks him in there. I'll lock it. Case, you want the fifth socket from the left, top panel. There's adapter plugs in the cabinet under the console. Needs one Ono Sendai 20 point into Hitachi 40. What kept you, the flatline asked and laughed. I told you not to laugh like that, Case said. Joke, boy, the construct said. Zero time lapse for me. Let me see what we got here. The Quang program was green, exactly the shade of the TA ice. Even as Case watched, it grew gradually more opaque, though he could see the black mirrored shark thing clearly when he looked up. Right on, the flatline said. Right, Case said, and flipped. Like that, I'm sorry, Three Jane was saying as she bandaged Molly's head. Our unit says no concussion, no permanent damage to the eye. You didn't know him very well before you came here, did you? Didn't know him at all, Molly said bleakly. She was on her back on a high bed or padded table. Case couldn't feel the injured leg. The synesthetic effect of the original injection seemed to have worn off. The black ball was gone, but her hands were immobilized by soft straps she couldn't see. He wants to kill you, Three Jane said. Figures, Molly said staring up at the rough ceiling past a very bright light. I don't think I want him to, Three Jane said, and Molly painfully turned her head to look up into the dark eyes. Don't play with me, Molly said. But I think I might like to, Three Jane said, and bit to kiss her forehead, brushing the hair back with a warm hand. There were smears of blood on her pale jalaba. Where's he gone now, Molly asked. Another injection, probably, Three Jane said, straightening up. I think it might be fun to nurse you back to health, Molly. She smiled, absently wiping a bloody hand down the front of the robe. Your leg will need to be reset, but we can arrange that. What about Peter, Molly asked. Peter has become rather boring. I find drug use in general to be boring, she giggled, in others, at any rate. My father was a dedicated abuser, as you must have seen, Molly tensed. 
Don't alarm yourself. Three Jane's fingers brushed the skin above the waistband of the leather jeans. His suicide was the result of my having manipulated the safety margins of his freeze. I'd never actually met him, you know. I was decanted after he last went down to sleep. But I did know him very well. The cores know everything. I watched him kill my mother. I'll show you that when you're better. He strangles her in bed. Why did he kill her? Molly's unbandaged eye focused on the girl's face. He couldn't accept the direction she intended for our family. She commissioned the construction of our artificial intelligences. She was quite a visionary. She imagined us in a symbiotic relationship with the AIs, our corporate decisions made for us. Fascinating. But I've never understood her, really. And with her death, her direction was lost. All direction was lost, and we began to burrow into ourselves. Now we seldom come out. I'm the exception there. You said you were trying to kill the old man? You fiddled his cryogenic programs? Three Jane nodded. I had help from a ghost. That was what I thought when I was very young, that there were ghosts in the corporate cores, voices, one of them was what you call Wintermute, which is the Turing code for our burn AI, although the entity manipulating you is a sort of sub-program. One of them? There's more? One other. But that one hasn't spoken to me in years. It gave up, I think. I suspect that both represent the fruition of certain capacities my mother ordered designed into the original software. But she was an extremely secretive woman when she felt it necessary. Jane, love, Riviera asked cheerfully from somewhere out of sight. Are you enjoying yourself? Leave us alone, Peter. Playing doctor, Riviera said. Suddenly Molly stared into her own face, the image suspended ten centimeters from her nose. There were no bandages. The left implant was shattered, a long finger of silvered plastic driven deep in a socket that was an inverted pool of blood. Hideo, Three Jane said, stroking Molly's stomach. Hurt Peter if he doesn't go away. The projection vanished. 075840 in the darkness of the bandage die. He said you knew the code, Peter said. Wintermute needs the code. Case was suddenly aware of the chub key that lay on its nylon thong against the inner curve of her left breast. Yes, Three Jane said, withdrawing her hand. I do. I learned it as a child. But I think that Peter has a point in urging me not to surrender it. There would be Turing to contend with, if I read all this correctly, and ghosts are nothing if not capricious. Case jacked out. Strange little customer, huh? The fin grinned at Case from the old Sony. Case shrugged. He saw Malcolm coming back along the corridor with the Remington at his side. The Zionite was smiling, his head bobbing to a rhythm Case couldn't hear. A pair of thin yellow leads ran from his ears to a side pocket in his sleeveless jacket. Dub, man, Malcolm said. You're fucking crazy, Case told him. Hero came on. Righteous dub. Hey, guys, the Finn said. On your toes. Here comes your transportation. I can't finesse many numbers as smooth as the pick of eight gene that conjured doorman, but I can get you a ride over to Three Jane's place. Case was pulling the adapter from its socket when the riderless service cart swiveled into sight. The cart stopped in front of a door. A brawn micro-drone scuttled over mounded carpets and tapped one of its padded claws against an oversized rectangular door of dark, battered wood. Case stepped forward and tried the ornate brass knob. The door's hinges creaked plaintively as he edged it open, Malcolm stepping past him with the Remington thrust forward from his hip. Books, Malcolm said. The library. The white steel shelves with their labels. I know where we are, Case said. The brawn was plucking at the leg of his jeans, nipping at his ankle. He resisted a strong urge to kick it. Yeah, it ticked its way around the door. He followed it. 
The monitor in the library was another Sony as old as the first one. The brawn paused beneath it and executed a sort of jig. Winter mute, Case asked. The familiar features filled the screen. The fin smiled. Time to check in, Case, the fin said. His eyes screwed up against the smoke of his cigarette. Come on, man. Jack. The brawn threw itself against his ankle and began to climb his leg, its manipulators pinching his flesh through the thin black cloth. Shit! He slapped it aside and it struck the wall. Two of its limbs began to piston repeatedly, uselessly, pumping the air. What's wrong with the goddamn thing? Burned out, the fin said. Forget it. Jack in now. There were four sockets beneath the screen, but only one would accept the Hitachi adapter. He jacked in. Nothing. Gray void. No matrix. No grid. No cyberspace. The deck was gone, and on the far rim of consciousness, a scurrying, a fleeting impression of something rushing toward him across leagues of black mirror. He tried to scream. There seemed to be a city beyond the curve of beach, but it was far away. He crouched on his haunches on the damp sand, his arms wrapped tight across his knees, and shook. He stayed that way for what seemed a very long time, even after the shaking stopped. The city, if it was a city, was low and gray. At times it was obscured by banks of mist that came rolling in over the lapping surf. At one point he decided that it wasn't a city at all, but some single building, perhaps a ruin. He had no way of judging its distance. The sand was the shade of tarnished silver that hadn't gone entirely black. The beach was made of sand. The beach was very long. The sand was damp. The bottoms of his jeans were wet from the sand. He held himself and rocked, singing a song without words or tune. The sky was a different silver. Chiba, like the Chiba sky. Winter mute, he mumbled to his knees. Winter mute. It was growing dark now, and when he shivered, it was with a cold that finally forced him to stand. His knees and elbows ached. His nose was running. He wiped it on the cuff of his jacket, then searched one empty pocket after another. Jesus, he said, shoulders hunched, tucking his fingers beneath his arms for warmth. Jesus, his teeth began to chatter. The tide had left the beach combed with patterns more subtle than any a Tokyo gardener produced. When he'd taken a dozen steps in the direction of the now invisible city, he turned and looked back through the gathering dark. His footprints stretched to the point of his arrival. There were no other marks to disturb the tarnished sand. Time passed. He walked on. And then it was there, a glow defining itself with his every step, a rectangle, a door. Fire in there, he said, his words torn away by the wind. It was a bunker, stone or concrete, buried in drifts of the dark sand. The doorway was low, narrow, doorless, and deep, set into a wall at least a meter thick. Hey, Case said softly, hey. His fingers brushed the cold wall. There was a fire in there, shifting shadows on the sides of the entrance. He ducked low and was through, inside in three steps. A girl was crouched beside rusted steel, a sort of fireplace, where driftwood burned, the wind sucking smoke up a dented chimney. The fire was the only light, and as his gaze met the wide, startled eyes, he recognized her headband, a rolled scarf, printed with a pattern like magnified circuitry. He refused her arms that night, refused the food she offered him, the place beside her in the nest of blankets and shredded foam. He crouched beside the door finally and watched her sleep, listening to the wind scour the structure's walls. Every hour or so, he rose and crossed to the makeshift stove, adding fresh driftwood from the pile beside it, None of this was real, but cold was cold. She wasn't real, curled there on her side in the firelight. He watched her mouth, the lips parted slightly. She was the girl he remembered from their trip across the bay, and that was cruel. Mean motherfucker, he whispered to the wind, 
Don't take a chance, do you? Wouldn't give me any junkie, huh? I know what this is. He tried to keep the desperation from his voice. I know, see? I know who you are. You're the other one. Three Jane told Molly, burning bush. That wasn't Wintermute, it was you. He tried to warn me off with the brawn. Now you got me flatlined. You got me here. Nowhere. With a ghost. Like I remember her before. She stirred in her sleep, calling something out, drawing a scrap of blanket across her shoulder and cheek. You aren't anything, he said to the sleeping girl. You're dead and you mean fuck all to me anyway. Hear that, buddy? I know what you're doing. I'm flatlined. This is all taking about 20 seconds, right? I'm out on my ass in that library and my brain's dead. And pretty soon it'll be dead if you've got any sense. You don't want Wintermute to pull this scam off is all. So you can just hang me up here. Dixie'll run quang, but his ass is dead and you can second guess his moves. Sure, this Linda shit, yeah, that's all been you, hasn't it? Wintermute tried to use her when he sucked me into the Chiba construct, but he couldn't. Said it was too tricky. That was you moved the stars around at Freeside, wasn't it? That was you put her face on the dead puppet in Ashpool's room. Molly never saw that. You just edited her sim stim signal. Cause you think you can hurt me. Cause you think I gave a shit. Well, fuck you, whatever you're called. You won. You win. But none of it means anything to me now, right? Think I care? So why'd you do it to me this way? He was shaking again, his voice shrill. Honey, she said, twisting up from the rags of blankets. You come here now and sleep. I'll sit up you want. You gotta sleep, okay? When he woke, she was gone. The fire was dead, but it was warm in the bunker, sunlight slanting through the doorway to throw a crooked rectangle of gold on the ripped side of a fat fiber canister. The thing was a shipping container. He remembered them from the Chiba docks. Rolling out of the nest, he went to the canister and fished one of the things out, blinking at small print in a dozen languages. The English was on the bottom. Emergency ration, high pro, beef, type AG8. A listing of nutritive content. He fumbled a second one out. Eggs. If you're making this shit up, he said, you could lay on some real food, okay? He searched the room with the fireplace, finding a plastic canister filled with what he assumed was rainwater. Beside the nest of blankets against the wall lay a cheap red lighter, a seaman's knife with a cracked green handle, and her scarf. It was still knotted and stiff with sweat and dirt. He used the knife to open the yellow packets, dumping their contents into a rusted can that he found beside the stove. He dipped water from the canister, mixed the resulting mush with his fingers, and ate. It tasted vaguely like beef. When it was gone, he tossed the can into the fireplace and went out. Late afternoon, by the feel of the sun, its angle, he kicked off his damp nylon shoes and was startled by the warmth of the sand. In daylight, the beach was silver gray. The sky was cloudless, blue. He rounded the corner of the bunker and walked toward the surf, dropping his jacket on the sand. Don't know whose memories you're using for this one, he said when he reached the water. He peeled off his jeans and kicked them into the shallow surf, following them with t-shirt and underwear. What you doing, Case? He turned and found her ten meters down the beach, the white foam sliding past her ankles. The faded French fatigues had been hacked away above the knee. The skin below was smooth and brown. A breeze caught at her hair. Listen, he said, scooping his clothes up and walking toward her. I got a question for you. I won't ask you what you're doing here, but what exactly do you think I'm doing here? He stopped, a wet black jeans leg slapping against his bare thigh. You came last night, she said. She smiled at him. And that's enough for you? I just came? He said you would, she said, wrinkling her nose. She shrugged. He knows stuff like that, I guess. She lifted her left foot and rubbed salt from the other ankle. Awkward, childlike. And that's the last thing you remember? He watched her scrape the last of the freeze-dried hash from the rectangular steel box cover that was their only plate. She nodded her eyes huge in the firelight. I'm sorry, Case, honest to God. It was just the shit, I guess, and it was... 
She hunched forward, forearms across her knees, her face twisted for a few seconds with pain or its memory. I just needed the money. She glanced back at him. I'm real sorry I stole your ram. Never mind, he said. Doesn't mean anything. You just took it over to this guy and had him access it for you? Tony, she said. I'd been seeing him, kind of. Anyway, yeah, I remember him running it by on this monitor, and it was this real amazing graphic stuff, and I remember wondering how you... There weren't any graphics in there, he interrupted. Sure was. Next thing, I was on the beach, real early, sunrise. Those birds all yelling so lonely, scared because I didn't have a shot on me, nothing, and I knew I'd be getting sick. And I walked and I walked till it was dark, and I found this place, and next day the food washed in, all tangled in the green sea stuff like leaves of hard jelly. She slid her stick into the embers and left it there. Never did get sick, she said, as embers crawled. Missed cigarettes more. How about you, Case? You still wired? Firelight dancing under her cheekbones. No, he said, and then it no longer mattered what he knew, tasting the salt of her mouth where tears had dried. There was a strength that ran in her, something he'd known in Night City and held there, been held by it, held for a while away from time and death, from the relentless street that hunted them all. It was a place he'd known before. Not everyone could take him there, and somehow he always managed to forget it. Something he'd found and lost so many times. It belonged, he knew, he remembered, as she pulled him down, to the meat, the flesh the cowboys mocked. It was a vast thing, beyond knowing, a sea of information coated in spiral and pheromone, infinite intricacy that only the body, in its strong, blind way, could ever read. The zipper hung, caught, as he opened the French fatigues, the coils of tooth nylon clotted with salt. He broke it, some tiny metal part shooting off against the wall as salt rotten cloth gave, and then he was in her, effecting the transmission of the old message. Here, even here, in a place he knew for what it was, a coded model of some stranger's memory, the drive held. She shuddered against him as the stick caught fire, a leaping flare that threw their locked shadows across the bunker wall. And later, as they lay together, his hand between her thighs, he remembered her on the beach, the white foam pulling at her ankles, and he remembered what she had said. He told you I was coming, he said, but she only rolled against him, buttocks against his thighs, and put her hand over his, and muttered something out of dream. The music woke him, and at first it might have been the beat of his own heart. He sat up beside her, pulling his jacket over his shoulders in the pre-dawn chill, gray light from the doorway and the fire long dead. His vision crawled with ghost hieroglyphs, translucent lines of symbols arranging themselves against the neutral backdrop of the bunker wall. He looked at the backs of his hands, saw faint neon molecules crawling beneath the skin, ordered by the unknowable code. He raised his right hand and moved it experimentally. It left a faint fading trail of strobed after images. The hair stood up along his arms and at the back of his neck. He crouched there with his teeth bared and felt for the music. The pulse faded, returned, faded. What's wrong? She sat up, clawing hair from her eyes. Baby, I feel, he said, I feel like a drug. You get that here? She shook her head, reached for him, her hands on his upper arms. Linda, who told you? Who told you I'd come? Who? On the beach, she said, something forcing her to look away. A boy. I see him on the beach, maybe 13. He lives here. And what did he say? He said you'd come. He said you wouldn't hate me. He said we'd be okay here. And he told me where the rain pool was. He looks Mexican. Brazilian, Case said, as a new wave of symbols washed down the wall. I think he's from Rio. 
He got to his feet and began to struggle into his jeans. Case, she said, her voice shaking. Case, where are you going? I think I'll find that boy, he said as the music came surging back, still only a beat steady and familiar, although he couldn't place it in memory. Don't, Case, she said. I thought I saw something when I got here, a city down the beach, but yesterday it wasn't there. You ever seen that, Linda? He yanked his zipper up and tore at the impossible knot in his shoelaces, finally tossing the shoes into the corner. He left the bunker and struck out blindly, heading, he knew somehow, away from the sea. This book is continued on the other side of the cassette.